Alrighty, hello there. My name is Gary Pius and I work at the school and library learning at Abrams. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Mi pronombre es ella. I want to acknowledge the Muncie Larape, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which I work from in Manhattan, New York. And I recognize their continuing connection to the land and its resources. I encourage everyone to find out whose land you're on using the Native Land Digital site and support the Native community around you. Thank you all for joining us today. A few housekeeping items before we get started. This session is being recorded and you'll be able to find the link to the archive footage in the Abrams booth. Please feel free to jump in the chat to interact with us or just to say hi. We've enabled live transcription capability. So if you'd like to see the captioning, you can click on live transcript, the icon you see at the bottom of your screen and then show subtitle. I'm so excited to be here alongside author Marty Dumas. Today, we'll be chatting about Wild Seed Witch. Welcome, Marty. Thank you. I'm excited too. So my name is Marty Dumas, and I am a mom, a teacher, and a writer from New Orleans. I was a classroom teacher for 13 years. It's so much fun. I love my kids. My kids still love me. They're so awesome. But um, uh, that is the reason actually that I am a writer, even though I am a mom, like my writing actually comes from having been a classroom teacher. So while I was teaching, I mostly taught upper elementary. So mostly fourth and fifth grade, although I've like kind of dabbled across the board with different um, grades. So I uh, have taught most of the grades, but uh, fourth and fifth grade primarily. And as a classroom teacher, my classroom library was like such a huge piece for me because I love all the librarians, the school librarians that I've ever worked with, but like the way that a lot of elementary schools are set up, including the ones that I worked in, we couldn't get as much access. Like it was like the entire school of 1100 kids were trying to uh, use this one space. And that's like super overwhelming for the librarians. And um, so I tried to make sure that our classroom also had things in it so that our kids would be able to get things from the library, but also have things just like easy, ready to hand in my classroom. And so um, as a young classroom teacher in the uh, uh, like late 90s and the early 2000s, I had a really, really hard time finding books that had um, brown and black kids in them that were not about the struggle. Now, please, please do not get me wrong. We need history. We need to understand what came before us so that we don't repeat mistakes, so that we can understand um, the groundwork that is beneath us. However, particularly for the kids that were in my classroom, I can only speak for them really. That wasn't all they needed. They needed to see themselves now, like they needed to see themselves today and not always being oppressed because of the color of their skin. So while we needed all of the books that I was able to find, we also needed more, like more books that were about joy and about being a regular kid and like maybe having magic, you know, like that's, that could be a thing too, but it was a really, really hard thing to find. So then as a classroom teacher, I started just like filling in gaps, just writing. It's like, oh, I can do this. This is like a little skill that I have. I, I can fill in these gaps as we go. And we did a lot of reading and writing workshop in our classes. And so, um, my students were being encouraged to be authors themselves. So we together would refill our library shelves. We were writing stories for each other and uh, publishing them and, you know, covers the whole business, writing celebrations and putting them in our classroom library. And they were being moved back and forth among the kids, the same as the other books that were out there. And so for me, seeing what a need there was for them and how difficult it was to find, when I did eventually have my own children, I was like, all right, this is this is actually the last piece, not the first piece. I I need to do this. Like I can do this, so then I will do this. And so then it has been really important to me to create stories where black and brown children are centered because there are not enough yet. There's there are not enough yet. And all of the children need it, not just the black and brown children, because 
stories help reinforce other hum humans, humanity for all of us. So if you're mostly seeing stories where there's only one, two, maybe three different kinds of people who are the main people, subconsciously, it is really dramatically reinforced that those people are the most human, the most important. And we know that that's not correct. So then rather than complaining, I am, you know, trying to jump in there and, and make stories that help to fill that. And so all of my stories feature kids that I think feel very, very real and who have problems because I mean, like whose life does not have problems? Like that's, that's not really a thing, right? Um, that whose lives have problems, but their problems don't have anything to do with their race. They're just like, living their lives in a way that feels real and accurate to my own life experience and the experience of the people who are around me. Cause like, that's about as far as I'll be able to go. So um, I am really, really, really excited to be able to be here talking with all of you today, because this has actually become my life's passion and I am honored and privileged and elated to be able to do it and share it with so many people around the country and at this point around the world, which is kind of weird when you think about it. So The Wild Seed Witch is uh, going to be my 11th book for children, and it features Hassani, who is a YouTube-loving teen, young teen, who uh, one summer just thinks that she's going to spend it working on her YouTube channel, just regular stuff. She would be thrilled, oh, so happy, just like over the moon. If she could just get like maybe a hundred subscribers, instead the poor girl finds out that she is a witch. And, you know, I don't know that she's fully ready for all that is involved in being a witch, but what is definitely still involved in addition to the magic is all of the friendship connections, the family relations, and the life dynamics that come with being a young teen today. So I'm like really excited to be able to like get to talk with y'all a little bit more about it. And I hope that you'll be able to check out, like get excited that you will get excited to check out the Wild Seed Witch and uh, see if you are like looking to join a coven. It's cool. I don't know if you could tell, I mean, my video is off, so you couldn't, but I was aggressively nodding alongside you. <laughs> so I love a good aggressive nod, Gabby. That's like, that's primo. That's that's in there. Yeah. <laughs> so now I've got some questions for you. Okay. The first being that, like you mentioned, YouTube and content creation are both central to the plot and how Hassani identifies herself. Mm -hmm. So are there any YouTubers or content creators that inspire you or perhaps some that you think Hassani would be big fans of? Okay. So, um, I, actually, yes, I, I I'm sure that there are, there's so many that Hassani would be big fans of. I don't actually want to do that though, because like the makeup YouTube is deep y'all. It's like <laughs> really, really, really deep. And Hassani is a makeup YouTuber. And weirdly, even though I just wrote a book and I'm three quarters of the way through another book about a makeup YouTuber, I do not wear makeup. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I had to like get all of my stuff fact checked. I have my uh, niece who is um, uh, a makeup Instagrammer, an 18 year old makeup Instagrammer. She has, you know, she's going, making sure that I'm correct. I mean, I'm sure that between the two of us, we've still made mistakes, but you know, like it's, it's out there, but uh, she would be better for recommending that. However, I adore YouTube. I'm 45 and I'm like, a huge fan of YouTube um, because I feel like it has become a platform for so many different people to be able to express things like everything from like critical theory done by 19 year olds, which is so dope, right? Mm -hmm. All the way down to like, how do you actually restring your ukulele, right? Like it's, it's everything that's in there. So like I use it as such a huge source, but just like give people shouts out. Like I would totally shout out Nap Natural 85, who um, is the reason that I, I have learned to like give up the flat iron and um, embrace my natural hair, which is amazing. And then um, I would probably also, same thing for Fusion of Cultures, who's 
same business, but like based in the UK. And then um, I would also probably give a shout out to Catnip, who is an entrepreneur also based in the UK, who does um, uh, videos that just kind of show her day-to-day working life. And unbeknownst to Catnip, she has been my office mate for like two years now. So that's that's cool. We're tight, me and Catnip, like that. Like we hang out and I co-work, she works. It's good, right around there. Absolutely. I mean, I love that your niece is the one that's like fact checking for you. Um, and there's definitely a lot of YouTubers that have secretly been my coworker as well. So <laughs> I don't know if they'd love it if they knew, but no, they got to love it. You got to, you know, I mean, like, they like the views for sure. For sure. <laughs> but you're totally right that it is a wealth of resources from ukuleles to, you know, I've seen deep dives on like the vampire diaries and been like, oh, I didn't know that we like, critically analyze this. Truly here we are. deep dives, truly deep dives. Yeah. Like this is amazing intellectual work that's happening out there, you guys. So like, yeah, I get excited about it. <laughs> exactly. So flowers are big magical motifs in this story. And Hazani's flower is the morning glory. How did you end up deciding on that particular flower for her? And were there any close contenders? So there were no close contenders. That was always the flower. Okay. Um, The morning glory is, so New Orleans is semi-tropical. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so it's warm and and humid here most of the year. And morning glories are tropical flowers, but they grow, they grow like weeds here. They're everywhere. They're along, um, if there's a hurricane fence, there's probably some morning glories or somebody who was trying to stop them from growing along that fence. And they're beautiful. They're absolutely gorgeous. They're delicate. Their petals are delicate. They don't look like they would survive here. It looks like it would just be too hot and they would wilt away and they would, but because they know that they have learned to thrive here. I mean, and and in all the hot climates, I mean, to be fair, but (laughs) they've learned to thrive here by clothes thing. So there's this like self-protective action where they're only, if you're not up in the morning, you're not going to see it at its best. You're going to see like a weird, sad, shriveled little thing that's like on the fence. And it looks like you should fix your fence. But if you're out in the morning, it's amazing. And for me, that's, that's Hassani. Like that's where her character started was that idea of a person who is beautiful and thriving, but sometimes doesn't know it. (laughs) <laughs> like people are seeing the shriveled and not seeing the glory. So yeah, it was always hers. I love that. Just hidden resilience. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Friendship and a sense of belonging are important to any 13 year old. And Hassani is certainly no different. However, she struggles quite a bit to fit in at La Belle Demoiselle. You got she it. <laughs> one of the only scholarship students and is a wild seed, one of the only girls who didn't know she was destined to be a witch. How do you think she might have been different as a narrator and a main character if she was either in a different social class or raised as a witch? Those are excellent questions. Um, So the wild seed, just for um, context for people who haven't had a chance to look at the the book yet, um, the wild seed for me is a beautiful term right? It's Mm -hmm. um, an Octavia Butler term. I did not invent that. It is, it's, it, it, in every one of my books, I make a a reference, a a pointed intentional reference to a writer on whose shoulders I'm standing. And Octavia Butler is that for this book. But um, the wild seed for me is a beautiful reference. In context, in the story, it is almost meant as um, derogatory, right? Mm-hmm. Like you're wild, you're not refined, you're out there, right? And there are people in the story who don't have that viewpoint, but it is a prevalent viewpoint. And so um, Hassani's magic being so wild and <laughs> so out there, um, uh, the wild seed thing kind of sticks even harder. If she had been raised in a family w- where she knew her magic or where other people knew her magic so that she could have been refined earlier, I think that, A, we wouldn't have had a story at all because Mm -hmm. her understanding of herself would have been such that, or it would have been a very different story. Maybe we would have had a story, but her understanding of herself would have been such that she um, would have 
had to come to grips with that a lot sooner. So we maybe would have had a story where we didn't have an entrance as a regular person into this magical world. But also Hassani herself, I think, would actually maybe have learned to fear her power sooner mm. um, because she is unbelievably powerful. She doesn't know. At the end of this book, she doesn't know. At the end of book two, she's still not completely aware, um, but she will be, right? And um, if someone were in her life, in this world, um, people who, to whom you are related or have intentionally connected your magic, you can visually see it. Um, you know, there's other, but the least complicated version is that, right? So you can visually see it. If someone close to her had been able to visually see her magic, then um, she would probably be afraid of it, but she isn't, not quite yet. I love that. Um, I also really, really appreciate that Octavia Butler reference. Oh, <laughs> shouts out. I mean, like, you know, we're all standing here because <laughs> exactly because <laughs> we're standing on our shoulders. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So technology and magic go hand in hand in Wild Seed Witch, making for what we think is a pretty unique magic system. Teachers at La Belle Demoiselle mentioned that alumni are some of the top social media influencers and that failing to control her magic and finesse her charm could lead to Hassani losing subscribers and essentially being wiped off the face of the internet. Where did you draw inspiration for such a high stakes and tech savvy magic system? First of all, how hilarious is it that there's not a single person who has read that or known that that has not been like, oh my gosh, so harsh, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> what a 2022 world we live in. It's so great. Okay, so um, so yeah, so that that's part of it. Um, I have a weird theory of magic, which is that it 100% exists. And it fluctuates for people. And um, my, if my children were here, they are not, they're at school. If my children were here, I would just have them come on and tell it to you because I say it all the time. Magic is any work that is done by someone else that you do not understand, right? Mm -hmm. Your cell phone is probably a magic to you. <laughs> you don't know how it works, but you're using it all the time and, and it's an accepted magic. So you kind of have it there. So I, I love that concept. I, I use it all the time. And I think that um, it was a natural fit for this because it is now, it's now, the story is now. It's not, we're not whisked away to a, a different, a literal different world. We're not, it's, it's now. And I love the idea of the hope and possibility of magic and continuing to discover new magic because it just gives you more things to learn about and figure out. And then maybe that thing is not magic anymore, but you'll come across another magic like a little bit down the road. So I love this. And actually in my own head, I have worked out how all the tech works and magic, but um, you know, you have to like kind of drip that into stories. You can't just be like, hey, you guys, mm -hmm. here's a manual. If you like, you can read exactly how this flows through, but I have it. So, and it gives me joy. <laughs> I mean, a mental map does no one harm, but I do think that I'll probably carry that very bright concept with me that anytime I don't understand something, hey, it's not that I'm lacking information, it's that there's magic out there. It's a magic, That's a really yeah. great way of looking at it. <laughs> so you've touched on it just a little bit, but the setting is both important and, in my opinion, really engaging. You are a New Orleans resident like Kasami. Would you mind letting us know how this city is both important to you and the story? So um, I am born and raised, Motene Elve, à la Nouvelle Orleans, but um, my father was born in Bashri, a il papa Curivini. My grandfather was born and raised in Bashri, a Lipapa American. So my father and his father could not communicate with each other because they did not speak the same language. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather, um, who died when I was two weeks old, uh, did, was not able to communicate with his children because they chose not to speak Kurivini, Louisiana Creole with mm -hmm. their children on purpose so that they would do better in school. 
which was taught in American English, right? And um, that is such a harsh, stark <laughs> colonizer disconnect that it um, really sat with me, right? Forever, people would tell stories about my grandfather and they told them like he uh, was just stoic. Like he was just a quiet gentleman. And until I was maybe 13 or 14, it wasn't until then that I was like, wait a minute, did grandfather speak English? And they were like, no. I was like, oh, well, that makes sense. <laughs> that makes the whole thing make sense. So when I first started going to, um, when I was an adult, a young adult, and started going to Vashri, where my father's family is from, mm -hmm. I felt a really intense connection to the place, like an almost physical connection to the place, a place that I had not been very much, even though it's not very far from here. And it felt like a magic to me. <laughs> and so then I knew at some point that I would do something with that. Cause like when you're a creator, you can't, like when you have that overwhelming feeling, like you have, you have to do something with it at some point. So I knew that it would happen there. New Orleans is its own kind of magic. And it's really interesting because people, who are from here sometimes are not born here, but they realize it when they get here. The same way that I had that connection with uh, Vashri, where I was like, oh, I have this feeling. Yeah, I feel it. It's here. So what I wanted to be able to do is to help normalize New Orleans in a way that is real, which is like New Orleans is not actually a normal place. It's pretty cool. Like if you go other places and you're from New Orleans, you legit feel like an expat, whether or not you want to be here. <laughs> you're like, wait, what? Like y'all do what? Like how? But for us, New Orleans is very, 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 very normal. <laughs> and so then the idea of being able to do this, where again, we have a magic, like this, ma the magic of this place that is legitimately mixed in and like um, explanations of things like mixed in and connected with the magic. Like I mean, how could I have not done that? Like that's, yeah, that's just, that's real. That's what's happening. We're doing it. Let's go. It was like that. <laughs> totally. Um, Jenny said it in the chat, but there's absolutely a relatability there with loss of language and the importance of um, trying to maintain it or understand where the loss came from. So I really appreciate you sharing that and highlighting that with Louisiana Creole and Wild Seed Witch. So. The teachers at mm. La Belle Demoiselle are <laughs> constantly emphasizing the use of charm over magic. The girls wouldn't want to end up magicless by 30, after all. None of us How will, did you truly. go about distinguishing between those two? Okay. So um, it's never actually directly laid out in this book, which is why you're asking this question right now. It, it is it is a, a more integral part of book two, but we can we can drop little spoilers here now, which is fine too. So um yeah, no, I mean we're friends, right? Like you guys all Absolutely. Hold it. good. <laughs> yeah. So uh in the difference, the core difference between charm and magic is charm is something you do to yourself. Mm. Magic is something you do to someone else. Charm is about mm. elevating yourself, it's about filling yourself, it's about shining your light from inside. And you can do that on an infinite loop because you are feeding yourself. You'll never burn out. Okay. Magic is you trying to work other people. <laughs> and you can definitely run out like that. So that, that, that's it. That's it right there. I love that. So thank you for that context. <laughs> cool. Cool. Hope it works out. <laughs> I think it will. Arguably, my favorite question for you okay. is the kittens are a surprise for both the students and the readers. They end up being a way to exercise control over magic, like you were talking about, though in my home, it certainly feels like the cats are the ones with all the power. Are any of the book kitties inspired by real life furry friends? Every single one. So um, to the surprise of absolutely no one, I am a cat person. I love dogs. Like I, I do. I super love dogs. I have a God dog. Like this is, this is a thing, right? But I am a cat person. And so then all of the cats are like my cats <laughs> through, through life. So that you, you've got them all in there, including a fellow who was a sadly short-lived orange tabby kitten that I had like, right. Yes. He was, but, but just still holds my heart. I still feel sad 
when I think about it, but he's getting to live. Here we go. In the, in this story, Othello will live for so much longer. So um, all of, yes. So definitely a cat person, but like extreme where, you know, like, I don't know if you're a person who adopts a cat or who a cat adopts you. I think the cat adopts me. Okay. So like I have every cat that I've ever had has adopted me off the street. Okay. Yeah, so, they just do that. <laughs> they have right. all the power in my opinion. Right, right. So like for me, I was like, okay, well, that's a little witchy. Like when you're sitting in a coffee shop with an open door and like the cats are coming up to you and nobody else, that's me. That's the life I'm living. So I'm like, you know, we're we're pulling this in. I'm gonna embrace this. And my sister, who has been afraid that I would become a 30 cat lady, um, <laughs> I, I won't assuage her fear because I mean it could still happen you know it hasn't happened yet I just have the one cat Gree Gree who is two shades of gray that's why he's Gree Gree you get it but also like that New Orleans thing with the Gree Gree okay so um uh but uh for now just the one but he's the only one that's not in the book because he's still with me so there we go oh I adore that especially Othello one of my secret favorite characters Othello yeah Hashtag Black Girl Magic and the All BIPOC cast are a huge deal Mm -hmm. and certainly something that I adore. What's also special and a big deal for this book is something that you've already lightly touched on, the use of Louis as a Creole. Would you mind giving us a little insight on how you use this language within the book? Yes. So um, there's a couple things. One is that, um, so a lot of magic systems it's so interesting if you watch anime you'll realize that the magic languages is english right so mm-hmm. if you're like listening to it in japanese you like hear random words and you're like ice the sword and you're like oh english is the magic language that's <laughs> cool so all right so um so that's fine um most often i feel like in books in um that i've read in the the magic books that i've read um it's usually Latin based, like there's something Latin about it. And that's cool. Like, that's good. I've certainly done that. It's, it's, it's a huge part of our language, especially like classification systems, which then make it feel old and like official and like whatever, whatever. Hmm. For me, I was really wanting to tap back into that feeling of when I stepped into Vashri for the first time in however many years. And could like literally, I'm telling you, it felt like I could feel my ancestors standing around me. It was bizarre and powerful. And I really wanted to harness that power. But I, I'm learning Kurivini, but I don't speak Kurivini. Um, I, uh, speak enough French that we won't die. If I go to, if we go to France, we're good. But, but Curivini, I'm like having to seek out. So, um, Jonathan Myers, who is the current poet laureate of Baton Rouge, big ups to Jonathan, um, helped a lot because he is a native speaker of Curivini and he was so open and so generous and helping to like smooth out my rough translation poetry and like spells and stuff like that. It's like, thank you, Jonathan. And then also I'm currently taking, I'm taking a Curivini course from, uh, with a teacher named, um, Cliff Saint Laurent, who is also, um, well, he's not a native speaker, but like his family is, and he like learned as a young adult again, and he's currently based in California, but he's like running basically like a Creoles come home class, right? Like we all like come back and like, let's learn our language so that it doesn't, it doesn't die. Like it's not actually a dead language. Um, it's a living language and um, uh, it's up to us to keep it alive. So we're, we're working on it. I totally think that it is not bizarre to have that immediate sense of belonging um and there's a lot of first generation americans or immigrants that would absolutely agree with everything you said in that realm so thank you for sharing that okay cool um so you've also lightly touched on this and i'm hoping you're willing to sprinkle a little more i'm a novelist we can like talk forever (laughs) i mean wild seed witch is just the start of hasani's story do you want to give us a little bit more of a sneak peek into what's next for her Yes, I can give tiny little bits, but you know, okay. So um, the magic school, um, Belle Demoiselle, right? Um, Which is like stuffy and it is trying to refine people so that they can create a 
structure, like a strong foundation, like a structural support on which they can build whatever they want, right? So um, you kind of get to see that in the, in the thing. It's a, a finishing school. It's a mm-hmm. finite program. So it's not a place that's meant for you to go back over and over again, like year to year, um, like a seven year magic school that maybe people are familiar with. It's not, it's not like that. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, what it is though, is closer to something like, um, AKA or like a, uh, a fraternity or sorority where Mm -hmm. once you're a member, you're a member for life. And now you've opened up all these networks. So in this, second book, um, Hassani is getting to see inside the networks and she has not been raised in this magic society that has literally been all around her and almost in entirely plain sight. And so as she sees it, we'll get to see it too. I think it's fun. I hope that other people like it too. I cannot wait to see her tap into that network. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. (laughs) If I'm a librarian and after uh-huh. hearing from you today, I really want to book you for a school visit. What's the best way to do that? So I have a website. Um, my website is Marty with an I dumasbooks.com. And on my website, there's a tab that you can click that literally just says school visit. So you can click that. I do um, a lot of different kinds of them. Most of them are designed for in person, but I um, am I don't know, um, a sucker, stupid, a weirdo, um, because I offer free virtual school visits, free 30 minute virtual school visits for any class or school that has read one of my books, like the entire class. So, and it doesn't need to be all the same book, right? So like I've had teachers frequently, teachers will book me for those little 30 minute uh, visits because they have had kids do book clubs with my Mm -hmm. book. So then maybe five different books were in there, six different books. And so we have, uh, so that's a thing. But at at any rate, if you take a look at my website on the school visits tab, you'll be able to see all the kinds of things that I will do both in person and virtually. And then there's a little contact button that you can press and it will, it will connect us and we can see uh, if we can go from there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. And magical insight today marty somehow Uh, magical insight okay (laughs) somehow all of our time is up it's been so lovely chatting with you thank you to all of you in the audience for joining in and listening we are so grateful for everything you do in your communities and how you connect them with stories like wild seed witch we hope you and your loved ones are safe continue taking care of each other 